In this video, I'm going to share with you our best TMC practice questions from 2018. But first, cue the intro. What's up guys, Johnny Lunk here from respiratorytherapyzone.com. 2018 was an absolutely fantastic year. We created tons of helpful content for you guys on the blog and here on YouTube that helped thousands of students pass their board exams. Oh, just saying that, it's truly an honor and a privilege that I get to help students around the world and I am so thankful for you for letting me go along with you on your journey to becoming a respiratory therapist. And another great thing about 2018 is, I taught myself how to create videos, just like the one you're watching right now. Now I will admit, I am most definitely not a professional video editor or anything like that. I'm just a respiratory therapist. But I have improved a little and I do anticipate that these videos will continue to get better over time. So if you're watching this, thank you so much for bearing with me through this learning process. Now enough blabbering from me, in this video I went back through all of the previous videos from 2018 and compiled the best TMC practice questions all for you here in one place. As I've said time and time again, going through practice questions is one of the best strategies when it comes to preparing for the TMC exam. And I have seen thousands of students have success by doing so. So without further ado, here are the best of the best practice questions from this channel in 2018. Let's kick it off with the question about my favorite topic, mechanical ventilation. A 58-year-old post-operative male who weighs 78 kilograms is receiving volume-controlled, assist-controlled ventilation at a rate of 14 breaths per minute with a tidal volume of 650 milliliters and an FIL2 of 40%. The results of an arterial blood gas analysis are as follows. pH of 7.51, CO2 of 30, bicarb of 23, base excess of negative 1, PaO2 of 117, and an SaO2 of 99%. Based on this information, you should recommend which of the following. Is it A. Decrease the minute ventilation, B. Discontinue mechanical ventilation, C. Increase the peak flow setting or D. Administer IV bicarbonate. The correct answer is A. Decrease the minute ventilation. The blood gas results for this patient indicate acute or uncompensated respiratory alkalosis. To correct this problem, the CO2 needs to be raised. So, in order to raise the CO2, you need to decrease the minute ventilation. And we can do that in one of two ways, by either decreasing the tidal volume or by decreasing the rate. So, given that this patient's tidal volume is within the satisfactory range of 5 to 10 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight, the next best way to decrease his minute ventilation would be to decrease the set rate of breathing. None of the other choices really make sense in this situation. So, by using what we know about mechanical ventilation and the settings, as well as ABG results analysis and interpretation, you know that the correct answer has to be A. Decrease the minute ventilation. Atelectasis has been diagnosed via a chest x-ray on an unconscious patient who had a recent open heart surgery. Before surgery, the patient's best force vital capacity value was 55% of the predicted. What would you recommend in order to treat the patient's atelectasis? Is it A. Incentive spirometry B. IPPB C. Nasotracheal suctioning or D. Flutter the correct answer is B, IPPB. The key to getting this one correct is the word unconscious. The AARC clinical practice guidelines state that a forced vital capacity of less than 70% of predicted is an indication for IPPB when other forms of therapy have been unsuccessful. 
So in this case, you know it can't be incentive spirometry because the patient is unconscious. So if they're unconscious, they can't perform this maneuver. And also, you know it's not nasal tracheal suctioning because there is no indication for this for this patient. And you know it can't be flutter either because there's no indication for a flutter, such as retained secretions. So by using the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be B, IPPB. While assessing the airway of an intubated patient that is receiving positive pressure ventilation, you notice a large air leak throughout inspiration with a cuff pressure measurement of 15 centimeters of water pressure. In this case, you should do which of the following? Is it A, add 10 milliliters of additional air to the ET tube cuff? B, reassess the cuff pressure during expiration? C, replace the endotracheal tube with a larger size? Or D, inflate the ET tube cuff to between 20 to 30 centimeters of water pressure. The correct answer is D, inflate the ET tube cuff to between 20 to 30 centimeters of water pressure. Leakage around an endotracheal tube cuff can increase the incidence of aspiration as well as ventilator associated pneumonia. To minimize the likelihood of aspiration, you should maintain cuff pressures above 20 centimeters of water pressure, but no higher than 30 centimeters of water pressure. So the key to getting this one correct is that you must know the normal range for cuff pressures. And that is, always keep the cuff pressure between 20 to 30 centimeters of water pressure. And another thing to remember is that cuff pressure should be adjusted at least once every shift and be documented in the patient's chart. So for this patient with a cuff pressure measurement of 15 centimeters of water pressure, you know that that's just not quite enough. So the correct answer has to be D, inflate the ET tube cuff to between 20 to 30 centimeters of water pressure. A 69 year old male patient has distended external jugular veins even though his head and body are raised 45 degrees above his legs. This would likely indicate which of the following. Is it A, the patient has hypertension, B, the patient is fluid overloaded, C, the patient has emphysema, or D, the patient is dehydrated? The correct answer is B, the patient is fluid overloaded. Fluid overload causes the jugular veins to be distended. Dehydration is the opposite and this would result in jugular veins being flat, so you know it can't be that one. Emphysema and hypertension should not have any effect on the jugular veins, so by using the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be B, the patient is fluid overloaded. So on the TMC exam, just remember that if you see a patient that has distended external jugular veins, know that this is a sure sign of fluid overload. And for fluid overload, what is it that we always recommend? You guys know this, that's right, diuretics. And the most common one, of course, that you will likely see is Lasix. During postural drainage therapy, a patient's heart rate remains stable at 94 beats per minute and their oxygen saturation is 96%. However, after you pre-oxygenate the patient and begin nasal tracheal suctioning, the patient's heart rate suddenly drops to 42 beats per minute. What is the most likely cause of this problem? Is it A. Severe mucus plugging? B. Hypoxemia during suctioning? C vagal stimulation, or D, postural hypotension. The correct answer is C, vagal stimulation. Sudden and severe bradycardia during suctioning is most often associated with strong vagal stimulation due to mechanical manipulation of the airway. This is referred to as a vagal-vagal reflex where the tip of the suction catheter stimulates the vagus nerve. Hypoxemia, which tends to cause tachycardia, is unlikely here due to the fact that you pre-oxygenated the patient. Mucus plugging and postural hypotension really don't make sense in this situation. So by using what you know about the vagus nerve and the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be C, 
vagal stimulation. The physician orders an increase in PEEP from 10 to 14 centimeters of water pressure for a patient receiving mechanical ventilation. After you adjust the PEEP setting, you note a rapid drop in the patient's blood pressure and a significant rise in heart rate. Which of the following actions would be appropriate? Is it A. Increase the FIL2 by 10% B. Administer sodium bicarb C. Lower the patient's PEEP back to 10 centimeters of water pressure or D. Obtain a STAT electrocardiogram The correct answer is C. Lower the PEEP back to 10 centimeters of water pressure one of the adverse effects of PEEP is a decreased cardiac output, which is due to increased pleural pressure and decreased venous return. A rapid drop in a patient's blood pressure and rise in heart rate indicates a decreased cardiac output. As a respiratory therapist, whenever an adverse response to therapy occurs, in general, your first consideration should be to stop the therapy and restore the patient back to their prior state. So in this particular case, you will need to change the PEEP back to 10 centimeters of water pressure for this patient. None of the other options really make sense in this situation. So by using what we know about PEEP and the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be C. Lower the PEEP back to 10 centimeters of water pressure. While performing a routine ventilator check on a patient receiving volume controlled ventilation, you note that the peak airway pressure has decreased from a prior value of 52 centimeters of water pressure to 32 centimeters of water pressure. There have been no changes to the ventilator settings. Which of the following actions would be appropriate at this time? Is it A. Increase the flow until the pressure equals 50 centimeters of water pressure. B. Check the patient ventilator circuit for system leaks. C. Increase the volume until the pressure equals 50 centimeters of water pressure. Or D. Check for increased secretions and suction if needed. The correct answer is B. Check the patient ventilator circuit for system leaks. On patients receiving volume controlled ventilation, a decrease in peak pressure most commonly occurs when the patient ventilator system has a leak. In this case, you should check for and correct any circuit leaks as soon as possible. The other causes that would result in a decreased peak airway pressure include the clearing of secretions and an increase in lung compliance. So by going through these answer choices, you know that the correct answer has to be B. Check the ventilator circuit for system leaks. Which of the following medications would you recommend for a mechanically ventilated patient in need of sedation? Is it A. Prozac B. Nimbex C. Dexedrine or D. Diprovan the correct answer is D. Diprovan. Common medications used to sedate mechanically ventilated patients include benzodiazepines like Versed, hypnotics like Diprovan, and alpha-2 agonists like Presidex. Opioid analgesics like fentanyl can also be used as sedating agents. Now let's talk about the other answer choices. Nimbex is a neuromuscular blocking agent, Dexedrine is a stimulant, and Prozac is an antidepressant, so you know the answer can't be any of those. So by using what you know about medications, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be D. Diprovan, aka Propofol. You have a patient that is receiving pressure controlled, assist controlled ventilation. Which of the following changes would you expect to occur if the patient's lung compliance were to decrease? Is it A, the inspiratory time will increase? B, the PEEP level will decrease? C, the peak pressure will increase? Or D, the delivered volume will decrease? 
The correct answer is D. The delivered volume will decrease. When faced with either a decrease in lung or thoracic compliance, a ventilator operating in the pressure control mode will continue delivering a constant pressure, but a decreased tidal volume. If the inspiratory time is not preset, for example in pressure support ventilation, then it may actually decrease. Peep levels should not be affected and the peak pressure levels would decrease in this situation, so you know it can't be that one. So, by using what we know about lung compliance and the process of elimination, you know the correct answer has to be D. The delivered volume will decrease. Which of the following represents the primary indication for inhaled nitric oxide? Is it A, hypoxemia associated with obstructive sleep apnea, B, hypoxemia in neonates with persistent pulmonary hypertension, C, ventilatory failure in premature neonates, or D, hypoxemia associated with hyaline membrane disease? The correct answer is B. Hypoxemia in neonates with persistent pulmonary hypertension. The primary indication and approved use of inhaled nitric oxide is for the treatment of term or near term neonates with hypoxemic respiratory failure due to persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, also termed PPHN. You can easily look at this question along with the answer choices to see that there is only one that could possibly be the correct answer. So by using what you know about inhaled nitric oxide along with the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be B. Hypoxemia in neonates with persistent pulmonary hypertension. Which of the following is true regarding synchronous intermittent mandatory ventilation, aka SIMV? Is it A. Machine breaths cannot be pressure controlled. B. Asynchrony is prevented during machine breaths. C. Only partial ventilatory support can be provided. Or D. The patient normally contributes to minute ventilation. The correct answer is D. The patient normally contributes to minute ventilation. SIMV allows spontaneous breathing between machine breaths so that the patient can control both the overall rate and pattern and contribute to the total minute ventilation. SIMV provides full ventilatory support at normal rates and partial support at lower rates. Machine breaths may target either volume or pressure and spontaneous breaths may be pressure supported. Asynchronous breathing still can occur during machine breaths, usually due to improper machine sensitivity or flow settings. So after going through all the answer choices and by using what we know about SIMV, you know that the correct answer has to be D. The patient normally contributes to minute ventilation. A trauma patient has been receiving volume controlled SIMV via an endotracheal tube for the past three days. The attending surgeon anticipates that the patient will likely be on the ventilator for another four to five days. Which of the following actions would you recommend? Is it A. Switch from ET tube intubation to a tracheostomy. B. Switch to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. C. Switch to pressure controlled ventilation. Or D maintain the endotracheal tube in place? The correct answer is D. Maintain the endotracheal tube in place. For a patient who has had an endotracheal tube in place for one to three days and for whom extubation is anticipated within a week, it is normally best to continue support of the patient with the ET tube in place. In other words, this case is considered short term and you should not perform a tracheostomy. That is because 
we only use trachs for long-term mechanical ventilation patients who are expected to be on the ventilator for greater than 10 days. And if you go back and look, none of the other answer choices really make sense in this situation. So by using what we know about ET tubes and trachs, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be D. Maintain the endotracheal tube in place. You are trying to wean an alert, intubated patient off full ventilatory support using the CPAP protocol with 40% oxygen. Early in the initial effort, her respiratory rate increases from 24 to 30 breaths per minute and you start to observe some use of her accessory muscles while breathing. Which of the following would be your first action at this time? Is it A. Restore the patient to full ventilatory support B. Apply 5 to 10 of pressure support C. Increase the FIL2 to 50% or D. Extubate the patient and reevaluate. The correct answer is B. Apply 5 to 10 of pressure support. Your first action in this case should be to add a low level of pressure support ventilation to the CPAP. Pressure support can augment a patient's spontaneous tidal volume and thus allow for a more efficient breathing pattern and lower respiratory rate. Pressure support can also help unload the respiratory muscles from the extra work of breathing imposed by artificial airways and thus further aid in weaning the patient from the ventilator. So if you really look through the answer choices, you know that there can only be one correct answer and that's B. Apply 5 to 10 of pressure support. An alert patient with an elevated CO2 level and emphysema is given 45% oxygen by an air entrainment mask. One hour later, the nurse calls you to evaluate the patient and they are now very lethargic. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this problem? Is it A. Respiratory muscle fatigue B. Cerebral hypoxia C. Hypotension or D. Oxygen induced hypoventilation. The correct answer is D. Oxygen induced hypoventilation. Many patients with severe COPD are chronic CO2 retainers, which is characterized on a blood gas analysis as compensated respiratory acidosis. Such patients are prone to a phenomenon called oxygen induced hypoventilation in which high blood oxygen levels can alter the VQ balance in the lungs which increases dead space ventilation and the PaCO2. For these reasons, clinicians recommend titrating the FiO2 in these patients to keep their PaO2s in the 50 to 60 tor range which is equivalent to an SpO2 of 85 to 90%. So in this case, the patient is receiving too much oxygen, which is causing the hypoventilation. So you know that the correct answer has to be D, oxygen-induced hypoventilation. Your patient receiving volume control SIMV shows clinical signs of a tension pneumothorax. A chest x-ray confirms this suspicion. Which of the following actions would you recommend to treat this problem? Is it A. Lowering the peak inspiratory pressure B. Obtaining a stat arterial blood gas C. Performing a needle thoracostomy or D. Switching to pressure control SIMV The correct answer is C. Performing a needle thoracostomy a tension pneumothorax is a medical emergency. Treatment always involves decompression of the pleural space by either needle or tube thoracostomy, also known as chest tube insertion. Lowering the peak pressure will help prevent worsening of the problem but does nothing to treat it. And likewise, obtaining an ABG is not a priority and will not help resolve the pneumothorax. 
The key to getting this one correct is knowing that a thoracostomy is another term for chest tube, and this is something we always want to consider for a pneumothorax. So by using what we know about a pneumothorax and chest tubes, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be C, performing a needle thoracostomy. A 69-year-old male walked into the emergency department complaining of tightness of his chest with radiating left shoulder pain. He has a 35-pack year smoking history and shows physical signs of COPD. Which of the following would you recommend first? Is it A. Start oxygen therapy with a non-rebreathing mask at 15 liters per minute. B. Recommend a stat chest radiograph. C. Start low flow oxygen via nasal cannula at 2 liters per minute. Or D. Obtain an arterial blood gas sample. The correct answer is A. Start oxygen therapy with a non rebreathing mask at 15 liters per minute. This patient is showing signs and symptoms of a possible myocardial infarction, aka a heart attack. In these cases, immediate administration of oxygen at as high a concentration as possible is indicated and this is what should be done first in this situation. A high FIL2 can help improve myocardial oxygenation and prevent further injury. A possible history of COPD should never deter efforts to maximize oxygenation in patients with a suspected myocardial infarction. So by using our exuberant knowledge on this matter, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be A. Start oxygen therapy with a non-rebreathing mask at 15 liters per minute. A female patient has been on a high flow nasal cannula for two days following abdominal surgery. The patient's atelectasis has improved and the arterial blood gas results on a flow of 20 liters per minute and an FIL2 on 70% are as follows. PH of 7.38, CO2 of 44, PaO2 of 154, SAO2 of 98%, bicarb of 23, and a base excess of plus 2. Which of the following would you recommend? Is it A, decrease the flow, B, decrease the flow and FIL2 together, C, decrease the FIL2, or D, change to a standard nasal cannula? The correct answer is C, decrease the FIL2. Assuming a normal hemoglobin and hematocrit, a PaO2 of 154 is excessive and should be lowered. Also, after three days on a high FIL2, oxygen toxicity should definitely be a concern at this point. The best action in this case would be to lower the FIL2 while maintaining the flow at 20 liters per minute. Only at flows of at least 20 to 30 liters per minute can you expect a high flow nasal cannula to deliver the set FIL2 to adult patients. Lowering the flow will have a variable effect on the FIL2 and whenever possible you should try to avoid changing two parameters at the same time. So by using what we know about high flow nasal cannulas as well as the process of elimination you know that the correct answer has to be C. Decrease the FIL2. After weaning and extubation, you place a patient on a cool aerosol mask at 40% oxygen and they develop moderate hypoxemia and hypercapnia with a falling pH. Which of the following actions would you recommend at this time? Is it A increase the nebulizer oxygen concentration to 60%, B apply bi-level positive airway pressure via mask, C administer 50 IV sodium bicarbonate, or D reintubate and apply volume control ventilation. The correct answer is B apply bi-level positive airway pressure via mask. 
BiPAP, aka bilevel positive airway pressure, is a good option to help avoid reintubation of patients who develop mild to moderate hypercapnia or hypoxemia after extubation. This pretty much gives it away that there can only be one correct answer, but you should also remember BiPAP is also used to avoid the intubation of COPD patients requiring ventilatory support for acute on chronic ventilatory failure. Also to treat patients with exacerbations of CHF and pulmonary edema and to manage obstructive and central sleep apnea. So by using what we know about BiPAP as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be B. Apply bilevel positive airway pressure via mask. A neonate diagnosed with a pneumothorax was treated with a chest tube. After 36 hours, the respiratory therapist noticed that bubbling is present in the chest tube system. What should be done at this time? Is it A. Suggest the removal of the chest tube in 24 hours? B. Clamp the tube and obtain a chest x-ray. C. Keep the chest tube inserted until the bubbling stops. Or D. Remove the chest tube and obtain a follow-up chest x-ray. The correct answer is C. Keep the chest tube inserted until the bubbling stops. The chest tube should stay inserted and suction should be maintained until the fluctuation of air in the tube and acting bubbling have ceased. It is only at this time that the tube should be clamped and removed within 24 hours if there has been no reaccumulation of air in the pleural cavity. If the chest tube is removed too soon, before all the air is removed from the pleural cavity, this can be harmful to the neonate. So that means that we know that the correct answer has to be C. Keep the chest tube inserted until the bubbling stops. The doctor asked for your opinion about which weaning method would be most successful in a patient with a spontaneous tidal volume of 450 milliliters, an MIP of negative 14, and a vital capacity of 8 milliliters per kilogram. Which of the following methods should be recommended? Is it A. SIMV weaning, B. Pressure control ventilation, C. T piece and extubation in 30 minutes, or D, intermittent ventilator discontinuance. The correct answer is A, SIMV weaning. SIMV would be the safest weaning method for this patient with an acceptable tidal volume, but an inadequate vital capacity and MIP. The key to getting this one correct is that you have to know the normal values for MIP and vital capacity in regards to weaning. In SIMV, the ventilator will still provide intermittent deep breaths as well as alarms for safety. On the other hand, T-piece weaning offers no alarms and the patient is not ready for extubation. Pressure control ventilation is not a weaning method. So by using what we know about weaning, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be A, SIMV weaning. Which of the following medications should the respiratory therapist recommend for an infant with apnea of prematurity experiencing episodes of apnea? Is it A, caffeine? B. Benzodiazepines C. Antibiotics or D. Doxapram The correct answer is A. Caffeine Caffeine's proposed mechanisms include the stimulation of skeletal and diaphragmatic muscular contraction. It helps to increase the respiratory center's sensitivity to carbon dioxide and it helps with the stimulation of the central respiratory drive. Caffeine appears to be a safer drug 
and it can be given less frequently than aminophilin or theophylline. Not to mention, it is more effective in treating apnea. None of the other answer choices would be effective in regards to treating apnea, so you know that the correct answer has to be A. Caffeine. While reviewing the chart of a 63-year-old patient diagnosed with COPD and chronic hypoxemia, you would expect to find which of the following? Is it A. A decreased AP chest diameter B. Chronic respiratory alkalosis C. Secondary polycythemia or D. FRC less than predicted The correct answer is C. Secondary polycythemia Polycythemia is a disease state in which the volume percentage of red blood cells in the blood is elevated. A patient with COPD and chronic hypoxemia would be expected to exhibit CO2 retention aka respiratory acidosis, not alkalosis. Also typical in this case would be a secondary polycythemia and possibly signs of core pulmonale both due to chronic hypoxemia. And also for patients with COPD, the AP chest diameter would be increased above normal, as would the FRC. So we can rule out those answer choices as well. And that means that there can only be one correct answer, and it's C, secondary polycythemia. The doctor is having difficulty visualizing the airway of an obese patient during an emergency intubation procedure. He asks for your recommendation to quickly secure the airway and provide ventilation. Which of the following would you recommend at this time? Is it A, a cricothyrotomy, B, inserting an LMA, C, sedating the patient, or D? using a double lumen ET tube. The correct answer is B, inserting an LMA. In general, you should recommend a laryngeal mask airway when the physician is unable to properly visualize the vocal cords and needs to secure the airway quickly. An emergency cricothyrotomy is a surgical procedure indicated only when the oral and nasal routes are unavailable. Sedation may help, but agitation is not the problem with this patient. Likewise, changing the type of ET tube used will not help with visualizing the airway. So by using what we know about LMAs, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be B, inserting an LMA. The doctor is having difficulty orally intubating a patient with a suspected spinal injury because you are applying manual inline stabilization to the patient's head and neck. The patient is at risk of aspiration and will need ventilatory support. Which of the following would you recommend as the next step in securing the patient's airway? Is it A. Performing a cricothyrotomy and applying jet ventilation B. Foregoing inline stabilization and placing the patient in the sniffing position C. Abandoning endotracheal intubation and inserting a laryngeal mask airway or D, reattempting intubation using a bougie or fiber optic silect. The correct answer is D, reattempting intubation using a bougie or fiber optic silect. Due to the risk of aspiration and need for ventilatory support, the patient requires a cuffed endotracheal airway, which rules out the use of an LMA. If difficulty persists with a standard direct laryngoscopy while maintaining the head and neck in the neutral position, the best initial options to aid in tube insertion include using a tube introducer, aka a bougie, a light wand, fiber optic stylet, video laryngoscope, or fiber optic bronchoscope. 
surgical alternatives such as cricothyrotomy or a tracheotomy would also be a consideration, but only if the selected intubation aid fails to help secure the airway. So by using the process of elimination, we can conclude that the correct answer has to be D, reattempting intubation using a bougie or fiber optic silet. You are administering chest physical therapy to a 69 year old female patient with chronic bronchitis in the Trindleberg position. She then begins to cough up a small amount of fresh blood. What action should you take at this time? Is it A, continue the therapy and provide supplemental oxygen? B, continue the therapy but report the problem to the nurse? C, stop the therapy, stabilize the patient and contact the physician? Or D, immediately call a code and begin resuscitation? The correct answer is C, stop the therapy, stabilize the patient and contact the physician. Hemoptysis is the coughing up of blood from the respiratory tract and is always a serious problem. While hemoptysis is a sign of chronic bronchitis, it can also occur with lung cancer or serious infections such as tuberculosis, so it's definitely something that should be investigated further. In any case such as this, you should stop the treatment, stay with the patient until she is stable, and then contact the physician. So that means that there can only be one correct answer, and it's C. Stop the therapy, stabilize the patient, and contact the physician. High frequency ventilation would be indicated for all of the following situations except, is it A, laryngoscopy, B, bronchopleural fistula, C, a near drowning patient or D bronchoscopy the correct answer is C a near drowning patient near drowning patients are generally ventilated traditionally with assist control or SIMV mode with constant volume so basically there is no indication for high frequency ventilation for these patients High frequency ventilation has been shown effective ventilating patients with airway procedures such as laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy. It has also been shown effective in patients with a bronchopleural fistula because the small tidal volumes and low driving pressures do not force gas out through the lung tear which allows the tissues to heal. So we can go back through all the answered choices and see that there can only possibly be one correct answer and it's C, a near drowning patient. A 24 month old asthmatic child is placed on an inline small volume nebulizer while receiving volume control SIMV. Shortly after the treatment has started, an alarm on the servo-controlled humidifier is activated. Which of the following is the most likely cause for this alarm? Is it A, an empty water reservoir, B, low gas temperature, C, decreased humidity output, or D, a clogged expiratory filter? The correct answer is B. Low gas temperature. The 4 to 6 liters per minute of additional unheated gas flow added to the circuit when using a small volume nebulizer will lower the temperature at the patient's airway, which can trigger a humidifier alarm. Either the humidifier's low temperature alarm should be readjusted during the treatment or an electronic drug nebulizer should be used to avoid adding extra flow to the ventilator circuit. None of the other answer choices really make sense in this situation, so we know that the correct answer has to be B, low gas temperature.
you are called to work with a patient with obstructive sleep apnea that is receiving bi-level non-invasive positive pressure ventilation through a nasal mask. While asleep, you notice that the patient is snoring. Which of the following adjustments would you make? Is it A. Increase the respiratory rate B. Increase the upper pressure level C. Increase the lower pressure level or D. Loosen the nasal mask The correct answer is C. Increase the lower pressure level Increasing the lower pressure level will increase the CPAP pressure to open the patient's soft throat tissues and stop the snoring. A rate change will not affect the ventilator pressure, and increasing the upper pressure level will increase the tidal volume. It will not affect the lower pressure to stop the snoring. Loosening the nasal mask would cause a leak and lower pressures, which would actually cause the snoring to worsen. So by using what we know about non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be C, increase the lower pressure level. After a patient is intubated, your partner begins manual ventilation with 100% oxygen. During auscultation, you note decreased breath sounds on the left while also observing reduced chest wall movement on the same side. Which of the following has most likely occurred? Is it A. The right main stem bronchus has been intubated B. There is a right sided tension pneumothorax C. The left main stem bronchus has been intubated or D. The patient's esophagus has been intubated the correct answer is A. The right main stem bronchus has been intubated. While a patient is being manually ventilated after intubation, you should listen for equal bilateral breath sounds and observe the chest wall for adequate and equal chest expansion. In combination, a decrease in breath sounds on the left side with decreased left chest movement indicates that most likely the ET tube has been inserted too deep and is in the right main stem bronchus. This can be corrected by slowly withdrawing the tube while listening for the restoration of breath sounds on the left side. None of the other answer choices really make sense in this situation, so we know that the correct answer has to be A. The right main stem bronchus has been intubated. The following ABG results are obtained on four patients. Which of the following patients needs ventilatory support the most? You can pause the video for a moment to review the ABG results for these patients. Is the correct answer patient A, patient B, patient C, or patient D? The correct answer is Patient B. Although all four of these patients have CO2s above 50, only patient B has a life-threatening respiratory acidosis. That is because their pH of 7.14 is dangerously low. This indicates that they are not ventilating properly on their own. The other patients all exhibit varying degrees of compensated respiratory acidosis and are thus suffering from chronic, as opposed to acute, hypercapnic respiratory failure. So that means that only one of these patients is in serious need of ventilatory support, so we know that there is only one correct answer, and it has to be patient B. While palpating your patient's radial artery for one minute, you note 90 unevenly spaced beats with decreased pulse strength during inspiration. Which of the following best describes this patient's pulse? 
Is it A, thready pos, B, abounding pos, C, pulsus alternans, or D, pulsus paradoxus? The correct answer is D, pulsus paradoxus. Pulsus paradoxus is defined as an abnormal decrease in pulse strength and blood pressure during inspiration. It is commonly seen in patients with hyperinflation and air trapping and may also be observed in those with pericarditis and cardiac tamponade. The variable reduction in blood pressure can also cause some peripheral pulses to be lost accounting for the irregularity. This is not to be confused with pulsus alternans in which alternating strong and weak beats are palpated. Pulsus alternans almost always indicates left ventricular systolic failure as can occur in mitral or aortic valve disease and hypertrophic and congestive cardiomyopathy. So by going through the answer choices and using the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be D, pulsus paradoxus. Which of the following side effects should you look for when administering aerosolized albuterol to a patient? Is it A, bradycardia, B, bronchospasm, C, hypotension, or D, nervousness or tremors? The correct answer is D, nervousness or tremors. Although beta-2 adrenergic bronchodilators like albuterol have minimal cardiac side effects, they can cause tachycardia and or palpitations in susceptible patients. So this automatically rules out bradycardia. Albuterol helps to treat bronchospasm, so it definitely does not cause it. That one is just silly. Other side effects common to adrenergic agents in general include nervousness, tremors, and headache. So by using what we know about administering albuterol, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be D, nervousness or tremors. On physical examination, the respiratory therapist notes that an adolescent patient exhibits malnourishment with poor body development, clubbing, hyperresonance to percussion, and a productive cough. The patient also reports having foul smelling stools. These findings are most suggestive of Is it A. Acute bronchitis B. Cystic fibrosis C. Heart failure or D. Acute respiratory distress syndrome The correct answer is B. Cystic fibrosis Cystic fibrosis patients typically have signs and symptoms that include malnourishment and foul-smelling stools. Clubbing is present due to chronic hypoxemia. The productive cough occurs from the large amount of secretions that cannot be broken down in the lung due to the excessive absorption of fluid from the airway surface liquid. The lung suffers repeated infections due to the accumulation of these secretions. The subsequent damage results in obstructive lung disease and air trapping, which causes hyperresonance to percussion. None of the other answer choices really make sense in this situation, so you know that the correct answer has to be B, cystic fibrosis. As a respiratory therapist, you have given supplemental oxygen to a patient with pneumonia. What would cause this patient to be hypoxemic? Would it be a diffusion defect, capillary shunting, alveolar consolidation, hypoventilation? You can pause the video to review the choices. Is it A, 1 and 2, B, 2 and 3, C, 1 and 3, or D, all of the above? The correct answer is B, 2 and 3. Pneumonia causes hypoxemia because of alveolar consolidation, 
and related capillary shunting. A diffusion defect is found in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, not those with pneumonia. Because of hypoxemia, patients with pneumonia will hyperventilate, not hypoventilate. So by using what we know about pneumonia, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be capillary shunting and alveolar consolidation, which is B, 2 and 3. Which of the following would not be recommended for a critically ill patient with signs and symptoms of fluid overload? Is it A, initiate diuretic therapy, B, restrict and closely monitor fluid intake, C, administer steroids, or D, dialysis? The correct answer is C, administer steroids. Management of patients with fluid overload, aka overhydration, normally includes restriction of fluid intake, administration of diuretics, and in critically ill patients, the insertion of a central venous or pulmonary artery catheter to closely monitor fluid balance. If heart failure is suspected, anotropic agents may be considered temporarily. If renal failure is a contributing factor, Dialysis may be initiated. Corticosteroids tend to cause sodium and fluid retention, so you know this shouldn't be recommended at this time. That means, by using what we know about fluid overload, as well as the process of elimination, you know that the correct answer has to be C. Administer steroids. You are called and asked to decrease the PaCO2 of a patient receiving high-frequency oscillation ventilation. Which of the following should you consider adjusting? A. Decreasing the bias flow. B. Increasing the frequency. C. Adding mechanical dead space. Or D. Increasing the power or amplitude. The correct answer is increasing the power or amplitude. Increasing the power amplitude is usually the first step in lowering a high PaCO2. Decreasing the frequency can also lower the PaCO2. Remember that frequency changes during high frequency oscillatory ventilation affect CO2 elimination in a manner opposite to that observed during conventional ventilation. If hypercapnia is severe despite the use of the maximum power or amplitude and lowest frequency settings, you also can consider creating a cuff leak to enhance CO2 removal. So none of the other answer choices can work in this situation. So you know that the correct answer has to be D, increasing the power or amplitude. The doctor has ordered ribavirin to be administered by aerosol to an immunocompromised infant with RSV. Which of the following aerosol devices would you recommend in this situation? Is it A. Vibrating mesh nebulizer B. A dry powder inhaler C. Small volume jet nebulizer or D. Small particle aerosol generator The correct answer is D. Small particle aerosol generator the manufacturer of ribavirin, aka Virazole, recommends the small particle aerosol generator, also known as the SPAG, for administering this drug. The SPAG uses a unique drying system to provide small and uniformly distributed aerosol particles as required to penetrate into the fine bronchioles of infants. So for the TMC exam, when you see ribavirin, I want you to automatically think SPAG because that is the device needed to administer this drug. This is actually one of the many tips that I share in our course, Hacking the TMC Exam. It just kind of highlights some of the most important tips and tricks that I learned while taking the exam. If you're interested, you can find a link below in the description. So after reviewing the question, you wouldn't want to use the devices listed in any of the answer choices, so you know that the correct answer has to be D, small particle aerosol generator.
which of the following modes of ventilator support is indicated when a precise IE ratio must be maintained. Is it A, assist control ventilation, B, intermittent mandatory ventilation, C, control mode ventilation, or D, pressure support ventilation? The correct answer is C, control mode ventilation. Control mode ventilation, or CMV, is a mode in which the ventilator delivers the preset volume or pressure regardless of the patient's own inspiratory efforts. It is indicated in patients with severe neurological altercations, deep sedation, shock, or respiratory failure, and is the preferred mode of ventilatory support when a patient needs to maintain a precise IE ratio. This mode is also sometimes used in patients with an unstable or changing ventilatory drive. None of the other answer choices can provide a precise IE ratio, so we know that the correct answer has to be C, control mode ventilation. Alright guys, that is it. Thank you so much for watching all the way through to the end of this video. The fact that you did lets me know that you have what it takes to be a successful respiratory therapist. And again, thank you for letting me go along with you on this journey. If you haven't already, be sure to grab a copy of our free book, The RRT Cheat Sheet. I'll drop a link down below in the description. And also, since many students are interested. This video contains only a small sample of the practice questions that we have inside of our TMC test bank. It's a digital book that has over 1,000 of these practice questions, answers, and detailed rationales explaining why that answer is correct, just like the ones you'll see on the actual TMC exam. I always highly recommend going through practice questions to students who are getting ready to take the exam. And if you're interested, I'll drop a link to this as well down below. Thanks again for watching this video. If you thought it was helpful, smash that like button, comment, and subscribe. I will see you in the next video, and as always, breathe easy my friend.